Hello world, my name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I live and work here in London. I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. I regularly assess defendants in courts, in prisons and in special secure units that are reserved for the most dangerous and violent patients. Although I specialise in criminal psychiatry, I've also got expertise in most aspects of mental health. This video podcast series, A Psych for Sore Minds, explores a whole heap of mental health topics, particularly about severe mental illness and also how it's kind of connected to crime. And I'll share with you a little bit about life and the perspective of a psychiatrist. My USP, I think, is that I can, I get to discuss my own previous cases with you. I've got fascinating stories of people that I've personally assessed. So I would like you to make a Psych for Sore Minds your one-stop shop for mental health information. Today's episode is all about false confessions. As a bit of a trigger warning, the case that I'm going to discuss is a man who's a, an alleged paedophile, so it may not be suitable for those of a, of a nervous disposition, let's say. So sit back and enjoy, and welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. One thing that I'd like to make clear is that forensic psychiatrists or any type of expert witness are not allowed to give their opinions to the court about whether a confession was false or the truth. So recently I read this um, textbook which claimed that this was part of the role, but that is absolute BS. It was a textbook by a forensic psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Not that I have a chip on my shoulder about this kind of thing. Of course, we can have an opinion on this. I mean, anybody can have an opinion on anything. I could tell you what I think is the best cheese. But what I'm saying is that this is not admissible as evidence in a criminal court. This is because the validity of a confession is a factual matter for the court and it's not um, a psychiatric matter where an expert should give an opinion. In exactly the same way, we are never allowed to say whether we think a defendant is guilty or innocent. What a forensic psychiatrist is allowed to say is if somebody's mental state would have affected their ability to give a proper confession or not at that time, which might sound kind of similar, but it's, it's not the same thing. So what I'm saying is whether it's possible or not for the defendant to give a true confession, but ultimately it's up to the court so that's the judge, or if it goes to trial, then it's the jury to decide whether they actually did give a false confession. And unfortunately, I have to say that I've seen some poorly written reports in my career. And I've also worked with some, trying to think of a nice way to say this, uh, there isn't one. I've, I've worked with some clueless expert witness who clearly have overstepped their boundaries, the boundaries of what they're allowed to say. And I've seen other psychiatrists say under oath whilst being cross-examined that in their opinion someone is innocent or guilty of a crime or that in another case whether a particular confession uh, must be true. And I've also seen those same experts get shredded by the judges for overstepping their mark, not understanding their role. So my next question is, why do people give false confessions? Well, a common belief is that false confessions are always in the context of like police brutality, police lying or torturing or interrogating or bullying the suspect. And although that is relevant for the majority of the cases, it's not always the case. So here are some alternative scenarios. The accused could be drunk or on drugs at the time of the crime, and they might not have any actual memory of what happened and therefore they might be susceptible to suggestion, or they could have a mental illness like um, psychotic depression that could potentially make it difficult for somebody to distinguish reality from fantasy. So they might actually have falsely thought they did it. And all of what I just said is actually very relevant to the case that I'm gonna talk about later, my real life case. Another scenario might be somebody who's got a learning disability or is just generally vulnerable, who might not understand the consequences of giving such a confession. Or they might be susceptible to the influence of others. So they're kind of coaxed into a confession. I think this is similar to what happened to Brendan Dassey in Making a Murderer, although it was a while since I've seen it. Please tell me if I'm wrong. There are occasionally people who even make false confessions just to be infamous. Some people believe they can gain like glory or fame or notoriety and sometimes they're confused about what they did 
uh, or where they were at the crime, like for example, a habitual criminal. So just to give you a random statistic about false confessions to glory, in 1986, more than 100 people confessed to the murder of the Swedish prime minister named Olof Palme. Now onto my case. This was about a man who was 75 years old, let's call him Mr. P. So when I assessed him a few years ago, he used to be a coach in a school in Scotland, although he had retired. And there were some accusations in the late 1980s that he had sexually abused a number of boys, although the charges were eventually dropped due to lack of evidence. And this whole process caused Mr. P some some depression as well as some other social issues later on in his life so for example his wife left him and also um, there was an incident where he was seriously assaulted and stabbed and I must say I did wonder whether that incident was connected to the allegations of sexual abuse but I guess we'll never know so this man Mr P had three serious suicide attempts over the space of several years two were attempts for him to hang himself and one was by way of like car exhaust fumes. Now I know that probably at least some of you are thinking, good, he deserved it. However, I would point out firstly, as an expert witness, I am not allowed to judge. You're welcome to, but I can't. And also I'm only allowed to give opinions on psychiatric matters. And also another point is that we, they're allegations, right? We cannot say for definite, whether they happened or not. Although I suppose the counter argument might be that there were multiple accusations and you could say there's no smoke without fire. So Mr. P apparently made two confessions stating that he had sexually abused uh, boys and they were very specific exactly what happened and when it happened. The first time was shortly after he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital after a failed suicide attempt, a hanging. He report reportedly told, he made his confessions to a doctor and the second time, the more recent time, shortly before I saw him, was in a suicide note that he'd written uh, when, when he did the, the car exhaust fume attempt of suicide, which obviously failed. So I was instructed by the Crown Prosecution Service to assess him. By the time I'd seen him, a forensic psychiatrist on behalf of the defense had assessed him and he stated that Mr. P was suffering from a psychotic depression and therefore he could have been delusional and he could have made up these confessions. Specifically, psychotic depression is associated with what's called nihilistic delusions and also delusions of guilt. So nihilistic delusions typically are beliefs like the world doesn't exist or that you don't exist or that there's just no future for you or also maybe that you're dead or your organs are dead and delusions of guilt are exactly what they sound like. So the defense psychiatrist knew what he was doing, yeah, and he said that he, he said that the confessions definitely weren't false, but Mr. P's mental state at the time is such that it's feasible that he did not have the ability to make a true confession which could be relied as, as evidence. So now my turn. So I assessed Mr. P, I looked through his medical notes really carefully and I thought about this. And I noticed that the symptoms indicated a moderate, mild to moderate depression, not a severe depression. And despite what the forensic, the other psychiatrist said, this was kind of matched uh, what he said about the severity. So I pointed out to the court that you do not get psychotic depression, you don't get delusional symptoms or nihilistic delusions or delusions of guilt. You don't get that with this severity of depression. Almost by definition, your depression has to be very severe for you to have these kinds of delusions. Therefore, I concluded on the balance of probabilities, although Mr. P's mental state was a bit sort of agitated and disturbed, and obviously, you know, he was he was upset and distressed because both times he he was in the context of a suicide attempt, either after a suicide attempt or when he was about to commit suicide. However, despite all of that, in my opinion, a very severe depression was just not in keeping with the symptoms reported in his notes. So there's no psychiatric explanation as to why Mr. P would have made that confession. So for example, having delusional memories or beliefs about committing sexual assault, which he didn't do. 
Now, obviously, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what I'm sort of saying indirectly in between the lines. I'm indicating to the court that the confessions were probably not false. However, I didn't say it directly, so I didn't overstep my mark. I said if they were false for whatever reason, then mental illness would not be that reason. So if I had said they were not false, and if I'd have overstepped the boundary of my role, my evidence could have feasibly, been, feasibly have been thrown out of court, and I could have been invalidated by aggressive cross-examination from the opposing sides, sides barrister or the judge, as I have seen have happened a few times in my career to other expert witness, with, to be fair, maybe a modicum of glee from my part. Okay, so that's the end of this episode. Please let me know if any of you, oh dear viewers, have ever falsely admitted to anything, ideally a bit more palatable than paedophilia. And please, I'd love to know the reasons why. So my next podcast is a bit unusual. It's going to be my professional opinions on the mental state of Kanye West. And there's a reason for this. This is because I was asked about this specifically during another interview that I did for another episode of a podcast with a lovely lady named Ariel from Malice Podcast. And we were talking about it. It got me thinking. Uh, I couldn't stop thinking about Kanye West and his symptoms. And then I did some research and it turns out there's a lot of interesting things for me to say on this topic. Before I go, I just want to remind you again, as I've mentioned in other videos, that I'm going to be part of CrimeCon 2021, which will be in June in London next year. And I'd love you guys to come down and be a part of it. So it's it's a convention about all kinds of aspects of true crimes. You're going to have TV guests, you're going to have personalities, you're going to have celebrities, you're going to have experts. And personally, I'm going to be doing a talk, which I think is really interesting. It's about real life cases too, that I've personally assessed of people who've actually murdered their own family members. And it's quite gruesome. It's about their mental Ill states at the time. One of them was mentally ill. I think one of them wasn't. I'm going to go into it a bit more detail in another short video that I'll be releasing soon on this channel. So please keep an eye out to it for it. So for future episodes of A Psych for Sore Minds, I'm open to suggestions. So if you're listening, if you're watching, and if you have any particular ideas, anything about mental health, anything you want me to dissect from the perspective of a psychiatrist to inform you or to inform other people, then please do hit me up. I'm all ears. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but actually it's even more effective than co in combating coronavirus as injecting bleach into your veins. Other thing I'd like you to do please is follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page and submit an episode idea or any questions to our email address, which is psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. And if you're referencing me on social media, use the hashtag psychsore. Please tell your favorite people about a psych for sore, for sore minds. They deserve it. Spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic, homies. <laughs>